Hey folks, we're back at the studio. Uh, before we get into the uh, conversation for today, what I want you to start thinking about is whether you can communicate back to me in the same medium. Um, I'm just setting my camera up, taking a piece of Velcro, sticking it to the back, and just sticking it on things. And that gives me all sorts of crazy angles. I just need you to consider the idea of responding to my questions via video blog. Not very tricky. It doesn't have to be a long, drawn-out, elaborate answer, and it doesn't necessarily have to be flashy or have all sorts of transitions or anything. Set your camera up, record a quick uh, uh, response, one to three minutes, totally fine. Answer one of the questions. If you do the video blog, you don't have to answer all three. You just have to answer one. Welcome to week three of Films About Painting. This week I'm going to be discussing two related topics. One is inspiration and the other is revolution. These two topics uh, um, are very interesting to me because of course uh, I happen to be living in a fairly interesting revolutionary time and I'm often quite inspired by that and I'm quite very 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 inspired by the uh, the works being done by some of the revolutionaries whether it be across uh, um, North Africa, whether it be uh, um, across the Occupy movements all over the cities, Chicago, Atlanta, Oakland, New York City, and so on, right? Let's start with inspiration. I've often been inspired by history. Um, when I was going into undergrad, I was torn between American history and um, art. I really like storytelling. I think art is an interesting way, vehicle of storytelling. And of course, history is a, sort of a trusted story, right? Um, my biggest problem is that I'm always torn between whether I want to expand the story or tell a, tell a, a, a dramatized, hyper-reality version of the story or if I'm just going to tell the story. If I'm telling a hyper-realistic version of the story, I might be making a piece of art. I might be making a painting. Um, I made a lot of paintings based on this inspiration uh, for history by tearing up uh, old encyclopedias. Um, I like this particular one. You sort of can see text just being used as a texture in this particular case. Um, I've got uh, a piece over here where I tore up an old encyclopedia, covered an entire canvas, and took one of the images, which was of a microphone, to, uh, uh, to create a giant painting. Um, I like tearing up old books because I can use some of the history that's inside of them to create a new story, to tell a new story. This is not my artwork. This is by a friend of mine named Amy Sell. She's working on this. Um, I think it's a hand crank device that uh, will light up lights inside of these houses. It's going to be put into a refrigerator downtown sometime later this summer. Um, I've been quite inspired by Amy's work. She makes all sorts of crazy stuff out of crazy stuff. I do collage. She does collage. She uses different media than I do, but I'm always quite inspired by what she's doing. I have to look at what other people are doing to just keep my brain moving. Inspiration is uh, the most difficult thing for an artist, but is the most necessary thing for an artist. After light, which allows people to see, inspiration allows artists to decide what they should see. But I need some input in order to create some output. Inspiration is that input. This painting is by a friend of mine named Nat Sodi. Um, this is one of the first paintings that he ever made. And he made the entire painting by using uh, giant number fives, middle size number fives, tiny number fives. Every mark on here is a uh, five. Um, I'd never thought about painting this way. He had never really painted, and he just decided to paint this way. This sort of thing completely inspires me in a number of ways, both the way he made it, but also the concept, right? It ends up looking like a crazy hive of fives, like a hive, hive of bees, but a hive of fives. Um, I ended up naming a band Hive of Fives. He was in that band also. Um, almost every band that I've had since this painting's been made has had the number five in it somehow. Um, totally inspirational. Somehow a painting inspired me to name a band something. Inspiration is this crazy thing, but it helps with one key thing. Blank canvas syndrome is something that is uh, uh, 
very similar to uh, uh, writer's block. Trying to figure out what to do when you've got a totally brand new blank canvas and you don't know what to paint on it. Um, running around the world, trying to fill your brain with as many ideas as possible, is the whole idea of inspiration. Inspiration is what will turn this into a masterpiece. Inspiration is what will get this past its current spot. Sometimes artists are inspired by other artists. Sometimes artists are inspired by people operating in all sorts of different mediums, whether they be writers or filmmakers. Sometimes artists are inspired by things that are happening in the world. Um, I'm inspired by a little bit of each. Um, this canvas, I'm not sure what it's going to be yet. So we keep talking about inspiration. What is inspiration? What is it actually? Um, people have argued this for centuries, right? The Greeks often referred to uh, inspiration as some combination of madness and irrationality, right? Uh, um, Sigmund Freud sort of referred to it as the, the injured soul of the artist somehow coming out, right? Uh, the question is, is inspiration an outside forces on, on a creative person or is it inside forces on a creative person? Which is it? My personal opinion is that it's a reaction, right? You've got certain uh, history and, and, and things that have happened to you, things that you've experienced, um, knowledge that's been built up in your brain, and then you see something, and that reminds you of something else, which, which kicks off this chain reaction of ideas that ends up as something, right? Uh, there is no one moment of, poof, suddenly it's there, but perhaps these ideas are mingling there and suddenly the connections are made. Once the connections are made, yeah, then there might be a poof moment, but those connections had to have been built over years. Uh, the connections in your brain, the connections in your world, the connections in your life. Um, inspiration is a chain reaction. Um, now, because I'm inspired by history and because I'm inspired by encyclopedias, uh, a lot of people are inspired to give me gifts of encyclopedias. Um, I was uh, uh, hanging out at my Andy M's house, my Aunt Marilyn, and uh, this was right after my Uncle David passed away. And I got a copy of uh, this encyclopedia, which is the American History, uh, the American People's Encyclopedia, right? Uh, this one happens to uh, be, uh, have a beautifully illustrated image of uh, the Declaration of Independence, which I think will be interesting within a couple of moments here. Um, another friend of mine happened to give me this encyclopedia. This is the Encyclopedia of Diderot. We're going to be discussing Diderot quite a bit today. Uh, he was one of the people that created one of the first modern encyclopedias. That is an encyclopedia that's designed to be published and mass distributed. Prior to that, uh, going way back to the ancient times, people have been collecting knowledge. Um, but it was primarily so that they'd have a cheat sheet, so that they could know a little bit more than everybody else. Um, Diderot had a different idea. The idea of, of using contemporary technology, the printing press, to mass distribute information and to uh, share the collection of known knowledge with the entire world. This created a couple of problems because, of course, this collection of known knowledge included a lot of scientific knowledge that was directly at odds with the biblical knowledge, uh, the information that was distributed widely at that point, which was, of course, the Old Testament, the New Testament. Um, th this religious knowledge in a lot of ways is what gave the monarchy its power. Uh, the king is blessed by God and therefore he is in charge of everybody and that's why he's going to be living big and everybody else is going to be living small. If suddenly everybody in the world was starting to get all of this scientific knowledge that might be telling them that they are also, you know, equally human as everybody else, they might start to get ideas. They might start to get inspired. They might start to... Uh, start that chain reaction that's going to kick off a revolution or something. Now let's talk about revolution. Y'all are probably very familiar with the American Revolution probably been studying it since uh, middle school, maybe even elementary school. Um, the American Revolution was a situation where America was fed up with paying taxes to the British without being able to vote about it. Now what you might not know is that the reason that the British wanted to collect taxes is because they had fought against the French for seven years in America 
basically trying to defend America against the French, trying to protect them from these invasions that kept happening up in the north around Canada, down in the south around Louisiana. The French kept trying to take over America. The British fought them, and basically both the British and the French basically went bankrupt trying to do this. Because the British were bankrupt, they needed to raise a little bit of money, therefore they were taxing us. We didn't want to pay for the British. We didn't want to pay the British unless we could vote on it. And that's the understanding that uh, many of us might have about the American Revolution. But there was a lot more to it between the French, the British, and the Americans than just the taxes, just the money. There was also a lot of philosophy being thrown around. And uh, there's a lot of thinkers that were hanging out in France in the uh, uh, late 1700s, 1760s, 1770s. Among them was Diderot, the gentleman who uh, made that first modern encyclopedia. Um, but other folks that were uh, hanging out there were reading Diderot, were reading some of these other philosophers of uh, the French, and were taking that philosophy and were packaging it in their own way. One of them was a gentleman named Thomas Paine. He moved to America and he began publishing. One of the big things that triggered this revolution in America and in France and around the world at that time was massive distribution of information through the printing press. This technology was invented around the time of the Renaissance but really came into common use, public use, around the time of the Enlightenment. And that has got a lot to do with why the Enlightenment happened. People were suddenly getting a lot of information and were being enlightened. Even the common folks. Um, Thomas Paine, he basically wrote a book called Common Sense. This book basically outlined the rationale for the revolution. Uh, he basically looked at it as a logical, very logical, very human thing for, for people to be doing, to basically take power into their own hands. Thomas Paine, very inspired by the works of Diderot, put out this book. This book inspired the country of America. There's about two million people living in America at the time and half a million copies sold, right? A quarter of the people in America had a copy of this book. Extraordinarily inspirational. So Paine's first book, Common Sense, that got the ball rolling. His second book, The American Crisis, which came out in 1776, was actually read to every American soldier in the, in the, in the camps to try to inspire them to continue fighting. It was read in taverns to try to inspire people to go and join the revolution, to go and fight, even die for a cause that they perhaps wouldn't even completely understand if it weren't for the fact that this guy, Thomas Paine, could break it down into a language that they could easily understand. Diderot came up with the, uh, the modern encyclopedia. Ben Franklin came up with the modern almanac. Because he came up with the modern almanac, which was, it was a combination of witty words and philosophical sort of notions, but it was also a weather manual, a weather forecast, right? If you, we all know Ben Franklin did his experiments with electricity, with thunderstorms, being able to uh, create something that made everybody's house not burn down, the lightning rod, right? He was very familiar with weather. Because he was very revolutionary, and because he was very familiar with weather, he was inspired to go and have a conversation with the King of France. He knew that the King of France hated England. America was at war with England. He knew that, uh, that the King of France had a navy down in the Caribbean. He knew that hurricanes came into the Caribbean. He and Thomas Paine went to speak with the King of France and were able to inspire the King of France to not only give us their navy, but also to send us millions and millions of dollars that they couldn't necessarily afford to help us fight against the British. This was the beginning of the end of the American Revolution. This influx of cash and military support from France allowed us to win the American Revolution. As you all might remember, America got the, uh, the, the Statue of Liberty from France. And why would France send us a Statue of Liberty? Partly because our revolution inspired France to revolt against their king. Um, after the American Revolution and after the Seven Years' War, France was completely bankrupt. Paris, France was one of the worst places to possibly live. Um, it was total squalor. Uh, there was just sewage running through the, the river that ran through the River Seine, which runs through the center of Paris. Um, the, the place was ridiculously poor, and it was hyper-policed. There, uh, there were more police officers per person than in any other kingdom in the world because the king had to maintain order because the city of Paris exploded in population. It used to be that the plague killed half the Parisians at any given time. The plague, because of the Enlightenment, because of the Renaissance, was suddenly um, 
the scientific knowledge at the time was able to counter the plague, was able to kill the plague. So now there's huge numbers of people that were living much longer. So this population of Paris just ballooned, and Paris was in utter anarchy. It was, it was falling apart. It was in terrible, in terrible shape. Um, France was busy uh, um, taking part in all of these foreign wars, and 99% uh, were being held down by this 1% that was in charge. It's starting to sound kind of familiar. Sort of sounds like the, the words of the uh, Occupy movement in uh, New York City or around the world. Um, or even the, the Arab Spring that was going on across Africa. Small number of people controlling all of the money and a large number of people being held down by that control. Uh, so anyway, eventually the, uh, the French, inspired by the American Revolution, which was inspired by Thomas Paine, which was inspired by a French philosopher named Diderot, suddenly rise up, take over, and take down the king, execute the king, and now we're beginning modern Europe. A Europe without kings. A Europe that's not being controlled by um, a few powerful people, the kings, the, the, uh, the, the, the religious folk, but instead was trying to be governed by rational thought, trying to be governed by enlightened thought, trying to be governed by science as opposed to just the religion and just the religion that bestows power onto the king. It's interesting. Uh, inspiration powering revolution, revolution powering inspiration. These two things are chains of events. They're chain reactions. One thing which leads to another thing which leads to another thing which leads to another thing. What I want you to be able to do is to sort of see what happens when artists are inspired by war, specifically revolution. You're going to see two different painters. You're going to be seeing Goya and you're going to be seeing David. Um, and you'll be seeing three different filmmakers talk about those two different artists. Um, first you're going to be seeing uh, Simon Shama's David. You saw Simon Shama last week, his documentaries, very reenactment heavy. You'll get to sort of see these stories being told in a particularly interesting way. You'll be seeing Goya as, as told by, uh, uh, by Robert Hughes. Uh, he uses a very different strategy. He's sort of talking about the relationship that the paintings have on him. And he's going to be walking around a little bit more like uh, Timothy Marlowe did in the first week. Um, a lot more sort of uh, going to important places, talking, spending time in front of paintings. Um, Robert Hughes is a famous art historian that's been, uh, that's been working all over. Uh, he's originally from, a, um, from Australia but he's been working all over uh, uh, England and the U.S. For, for years, telling stories of famous artists. Uh, maybe later in the semester we'll see one of his works from the 70s and 80s. Very different style. He'll have a different hairdo. Um, and then we'll be seeing a guy named Matthew Collings talk about the two artists together. He'll actually do a little bit of a review of what we've seen so far and take us into the next, uh, into, into, the, into the sort of bring us up to current. Um, those three guys are going to be looking at these two painters in very different ways. And I think that it's really going to sort of help you put these pieces together. But I think that it's also important to understand how uh, this chain of events sort of leads, how uh, um, writers are going to influence politicians and politicians are going to influence artists, and then artists are going to change everything.